So back in June, my next guest made headlines with recession warnings and also sounding the alarm on U.S. debt. Joining me now, Double Line Capital CEO Jeffrey Gunlock. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I want to get to those issues, but uh, first, let's talk about this year. It's been a, an extraordinary year and obviously became a lot more eventful after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. And, and in some ways, it felt like initially it's sort of a, a blessing, right, in the sense that maybe it would stop the Federal Reserve from over-tightening. The narrative was that we see banks quickly tighten credit. The economy would slow down faster. Has it played out according to the script you envisioned at the time? Uh, pretty much so. I, I felt like the uh, losses at the at SVB and so forth it shut them down. It felt like those were kind of one-off situations because of the extraordinary maturities that they had and the fact that they were a victim of their own success. They uh, raised so much money because of the, the low interest rates and the money just poured in with the government money and they couldn't they had to invest in these zero yielding or one or two percent yielding government bonds. So uh, I was suspicious that maybe we'd get another one, but after about two months, uh, the, the problem seemed to pretty much dissipate. So I think it's played out ab about what I thought. I, I, I did think that the Fed was gonna raise rates in the aftermath of the March uh, meltdown in some of the regional banks, and they, they've continued to do that. I believe uh, that the Fed should stop raising interest rates. I think that really they shouldn't bother to raise rates last time, but that's kind of where we stand. And this year is an unusual year, Charles. It's very much a mirror image of last year, at least in risk assets. Bonds started out to be a mirror image of 2022, but that's changed again. Right. We're now back up near the highs in yields let me uh, at many parts. I'm sorry, let me pick up on that. The um, this, this thing with the Federal Reserve, other than the ghost of Arthur Burns, right? And not, you know, living up to being Paul Volcker, What's driving their thought process there? It looks like everything they wanted, they're getting, maybe not as fast, but they're getting it. Yeah, uh, they really do seem to be con concerned about the inflation rate. I mean, Jay Powell was, I thought, marginally hawkish at Jackson Hole. Uh, he's been resolute, really, for the past 12 months that he is going to get inflation down to 2%. And it was looking good there when it got down to uh, actually 2.98, I think it was on the headline CPI, but they want the inflation rate to come down. And I think they understand that when you have uh, inflation pressures and they, there's still shelter pressures, which are probably gonna ease, but there's also wage pressures. The only way to get wage pressures down is to have demand for labor go down. And so, you know, I, I think it's true that they realize that they're going to have to have some sort of an economic slowdown. And we have so many cross currents right now. I saw the Beige Book yesterday, and the, the really the word of the day yesterday was the word subdued, which is in re, uh, relation to the labor market. We haven't heard the word subdued uh, describe the job market for a long time now. And uh, sure, it's only a two month period, July and August. But what's strange about this third quarter is there are these forecasts of GDP. There's one by the Atlanta Fed. It's called GDP Now. And it is forecasting GDP for the third quarter of 2023 here at 5.6%. And that's in the context of the Beige Book, which was, which was I think, uh, certainly uh, it needs to be characterized as somewhat downbeat relative to economic growth, particularly mm -hmm. manufacturing. You know, and, and yet at the same time, the St. Louis Fed forecast, uh, the Fed, Fed, Federal Reserve St. Louis economic forecast, they, they have a now cast, they call it, for, G, for GDP. It's slightly negative for the third quarter. So what's going on? How can there be a spread of that magnitude? I think what's, what's happening is the economy is heading into a transition. I remember we were laughing uh, back in early January, Charles, about the excess savings that people were talking about were still really high. And what, what is excess savings as opposed to savings? But that statistic has changed a lot. And a lot of the statistics have been changing rather rapidly over the past several months. That excess savings is, is about to go negative. Yeah. So it's going to be completely gone, all yeah. that stuff from the pandemic. Yeah. Another thing that economists got uh, uh, screwed up with is they were looking at year-over-year -year statistics, I think, uh, too intently. I think there was such a bulge of activity with all that pandemic money and all of the, you know, paid to to not work and all that sort of stuff. You know, the bulge in the money supply was so enormous, just like the increase 
in uh, home prices was so enormous in the aftermath of that. So we started to focus more on two and three year statistics. And those statistics are not nearly as recessionary as a strictly monetary approach using year over year. So for example, M2 is now negative year over year, right. it's been negative year over year all, all this while. And this is why so many monetary economists thought we'd be in a recession already, even by the, the second quarter of this year. But what they're missing is that while M2 is down, year over year, it's still up massively from where it was two or three years ago. So there's, it, we don't have that same uh, pattern that economists have trained themselves on. Same for inflation data. The PPI was up double digits on a year over year basis, and now it's down uh, on a year over year basis, but it's still very elevated over two or three years. I saw your segment with Don Luskin, and I sort of agree with uh, the context of his take that we still have very high prices, but we don't have all of that funny money around anymore and the excess savings are going negative. So what's happened is I think a, a, a dangerous cocktail. People change their behavior when they have exogenous shocks to the way they're living their life. So when you gave people, you don't have to pay your rent, you don't have to pay your student loan, here's a whole boatload of money uh, that you can have they go, they adjust their lifestyle to that. And then the money runs out from the government and they start uh, borrowing more money. Right. And they even when they weren't paying their rent, they were actually using their rent money probably to, to upgrade their lifestyle. And when they ran out of that and had to pay, pay their rent again, suddenly they realized they've borrowed a whole bunch of money. So not only do they have their rent bill, they also have the interest payment on their credit card bill. And we all know that credit card borrowing has uh, is increased very s strongly in recent months. And they also, you know, have to start paying their taxes again. Here in California, where I live, uh, my primary residence, we didn't, haven't had to pay our 2022 taxes, but we have to pay them October 15th. Other states, just in the last couple of months, like the state of New York, had to pay their 22 taxes. Maybe that's why we're starting to see the beige book looking less robust, right. why we're seeing uh, some subdued uh, economic growth from the yeah, beige and book. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen when people have to pay their California taxes? There's there's two things that happen. First of all, they suddenly feel a lot poorer, and the government gets some money. So the budget deficit, which has exploded, and that's what's been putting pressure on the bond market in part, is the issuance from the budget deficit has been so strong, and yet people have been reluctant to uh, you know Hoover in a whole bunch of long-term bonds because they seem to be depreciating uh, uh, on a fairly uh, right. Monotonic basis. Let me pick up on that so one I, second, Jeffrey, I, because because a, a couple of months ago I had Jim Grant on the show, and he said in his work that he sees us now the bond market, rather the U.S. bond market, has just entered into a secular bear market that can last up to four decades. I got to tell you, when he said it, I kind of brushed it off. Since then, it feels like maybe he's right. It, well, it could be, and it, it might, but it might uh, transpire in a way that is contrary to what people might expect. I like Jim Grant. I respect him a lot. I'm a paid-up subscriber to his service. I read his essay that just that came out in the middle of July that spoke to that bear market, and he's so self-deprecating, and that's one thing I like about uh, Jim Grant. He's so brilliant. He is so de self-deprecating about it, but he acknowledged in that essay in a self-deprecating manner that he wrote essentially the same essay about here comes a 40-year bear market in 2004. So uh, it can take a long time. That's one of my number one pieces of advice to people about right. investments is it takes a lot longer than people think. Now, what I'm saying about there could be a, a lengthy, painful bear market in bonds, it's not really the next move in the chess, chess game. I think it might happen because of the response to the next recession, which could be very inflationary. Mm. We, we've seen We've seen the playbook, right? When we had the global financial crisis, there was tons of money printing and quantitative easing, and we kept at it, and then we had the pandemic, and it's tons of money printing and quantitative easing, and the fiscal response keeps getting bigger. So I think what might happen is Don Luskin may be right, and that the Fed in their resolution to get inflation down towards or to 2% will probably overshoot, just like it overshot on the upside. They wanted to get inflation higher than two, my suspicion was they wanted to get it to four back in 2021, 20, early 22. Not only did it go to four, of course, it went to nine and the PPI went to double digits and import and export prices went to over 15% right. year over year basis. So if we've already fallen from nine 
back down to three. But now we're going back up a little bit again on the CPI. Right. And then I think it's going to keep the Fed uh, constantly resolute about things. But once the economy rolls over, which I think is going to happen with this uh, confluence of taxes have to be paid, uh, rent has to be paid, student loans have to be paid, credit card bills are getting very expensive and getting very large. You know, I, I think that what we'll end up doing is having the inflation rate go down ultimately when the recession comes to 2%, but probably then head in temporarily into deflation. And that will end up causing a reactionary response that will be highly inflationary. Yeah. I think in the next recession, the thing that will be so confounding to people is that bond yields, once we get deeper into the recession, bond yields will actually start to go up because of excessive um, money printing and monetary response. And so I, right now we're in a very tricky situation because the economy and investment markets seem to be in transition. But uh, for the time being, I saw your segment on Boil the Frog. I thought that was pretty clever. Um, I think that's JP Morgan's uh, yeah. graphic there. But uh, you know, I think that's where, sort of where we are. Right. Uh, that, that, that's, that's heading this way. But then I think the economy is going to hit a wall in the next six or six or eight months or so. And there's going to be a, a real shutdown in consumer activity due to all of these interest payments that have to be made. And of course, one thing that I always want to talk about is the government right. has a very onerous and increasing debt burden, of course, too. And I think the Fed, in the back of their mind, realizes that when the next recession comes, the amount of borrowing is going to be so enormous that uh, it's going to be a really bad idea to have interest rates right. higher than five and a half percent. Jeff. Because as it stands, the interest burden is exploding. It's going to get much worse in the next six or eight years. Let's leave it right there. It's fantastic. I, I love the way you walked us through all these scenarios. And we'll keep it in the back of my mind. And hopefully we can get you back on the show real soon.